Chapter Six of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six. One. When the first dubious November snow had filtered down, shading with white the bare clods in the ploughed fields, when the first small fire had been started in the furnace, which is the shrine of a Gopher Prairie home. Carol began to make the house her own. She dismissed the parlor furniture, the golden oak table with brass knobs, the moldy brocade chairs, the picture of the doctor. She went to Minneapolis to scamper through department stores and small Tenth Street shops devoted to ceramics and high thought. She had to ship her treasures, but she wanted to bring them back in her arms. Carpenters had torn out the partition between front parlor and back parlor thrown it into a long room on which she lavished yellow and deep blue. A Japanese obi with an intricacy of golden thread on stiff ultramarine tissue, which she hung as a panel against the maze wall. A couch with pillows of sapphire velvet and gold bands. Chairs which in Gopher Prairie seemed flippant. She hid the sacred family phonograph in the dining room and replaced its stand with a square cabinet on which was a squat blue jar between yellow candles. Kennicott decided against a fireplace. We'll have a new house in a couple of years anyway. She decorated only one room. The rest, Kennicott hinted, she'd better leave till he made a ten-strike. The brown cube of a house stirred and awakened. It seemed to be in motion. It welcomed her back from shopping. It lost its mildewed repression. The supreme verdict was Kennicott's well, by golly, I was afraid the new junk wouldn't be so comfortable, but I must say this divan, or whatever you call it, is a lot better than that bumpy old sofa we had, and when I look around, well, it's worth all it cost, I guess." Everyone in town took an interest in the refurnishing. The carpenters and painters who did not actually assist crossed the lawn to peer through the windows and exclaim, "'Fine! Look swell!' Dave Dyer at the drugstore, Harry Haydock and Ramey Weatherspoon at the Bon Ton repeated daily, "'How's the good work coming? I hear the house is getting to be real classy.' Even Mrs. Bogart. Mrs. Bogart lived across the alley from the rear of Carol's house. She was a widow and a prominent Baptist, and a good influence. She had so painfully reared three sons to be Christian gentlemen that one of them had become an Omaha bartender, one a professor of Greek, and one, Cyrus N. Bogart, a boy of fourteen who was still at home, the most brazen member of the toughest gang in Boytown. Mrs. Bogart was not the acid type of good influence. She was the soft, damp, fat, sighing, indigestive, clinging, melancholy, depressingly hopeful kind. There are in every large chicken-yard a number of old and indignant hens who resemble Mrs. Bogart and when they are served at Sunday noon dinner, as fricasseed chicken with thick dumplings, they keep up the resemblance. Carol had noted that Mrs. Bogart from her side window kept an eye upon the house. The Kennicotts and Mrs. Bogart did not move in the same sets, which meant precisely the same in Gopher Prairie as it did on Fifth Avenue or in Mayfair, but the good widow came calling. She wheezed in, sighed, gave Carol a pulpy hand, sighed, glanced sharply at the revelation of ankles as Carol crossed her legs, sighed, inspected the new blue chairs, smiled with a coy sighing sound, and gave voice. "'I've wanted to call on you so long, dearie. You know we're neighbors. But I thought I'd wait till you got settled. You must run in and see me. How much did that big chair cost?' Seventy-seven dollars?' Sev, sakes alive! Well, I suppose it's all right for them that can't afford it, though I do sometimes think, of course, as our pastor said once at Baptist Church, by the way, we haven't seen you there yet, and of course your husband was raised up a Baptist, and I do hope he won't drift away from the fold. Of course, we all know there isn't anything, not cleverness or gifts of gold or anything, that can make up for humility and the inward grace, and they can say what they want about the P.E. Church, but, of course, there's no church that has more history, or has stayed by the true principles of Christianity better than the Baptist Church, and—in what church were you raised, Mrs. Kennicott?" "'Why, I went to Congregational as a girl in Mankato, 
but my college was universalist. Well, but of course, as the Bible says, is it the Bible, at least I know I have heard it in church and everybody admits it, it's proper for the little bride to take her husband's vessel of faith, so we all hope we shall see you at the Baptist church, and, as I was saying, of course, I agree with Reverend Zitterell in thinking that the great trouble with this nation today is lack of spiritual faith, so few going to church and people automobiling on Sunday, and heaven knows what all. But still I do think that one trouble is this terrible waste of money, people feeling that they have got to have bathtubs and telephones in their houses. I heard you were selling the old furniture cheap." Yes. Well, of course you know your own mind, but I can't help thinking, when Will's ma was down here keeping house for him, she used to run in to see me real often. It was good enough furniture for her. But there, there, I mustn't croak. I just wanted to let you know that when you find you can't depend on a lot of these gadding young folks, like the Haydocks and the Dyers, and heaven only knows how much money Juanita Haydock blows in in a year, why, then you may be glad to know that slow old Auntie Bogart is always right there, and heaven knows. A portentous sigh. I hope you and your husband won't have any of the troubles with sickness and quarrelling and wasting money and all that so many of these young couples do have, and—but I must be running along now, dearie. It's been such a pleasure, and—just run in and see me any time. I hope Will is well. I thought he looked a wee mite peaked." It was twenty minutes later when Mrs. Bogart finally oozed out of the front door. Carol ran back into the living-room and jerked open the windows. That woman has left damp fingerprints in the air," she said. 2. Carol was extravagant, but at least she did not try to clear herself of blame by going about whimpering, I know I'm terribly extravagant, but I don't seem to be able to help it. Kennicott had never thought of giving her an allowance. His mother had never had one. As a wage-earning spinster, Carol had asserted to her fellow librarians that when she was married she was going to have an allowance and be businesslike and modern, but it was too much trouble to explain to Kennicott's kindly stubbornness that she was a practical housekeeper as well as a flighty playmate. She bought a budget plan account book and made her budgets as exact as budgets are likely to be when they lack budgets. For the first month it was a honeymoon jest to beg prettily, to confess, I haven't a cent in the house, dear, and to be told, you're an extravagant little rabbit. But the budget book made her realize how inexact were her finances. She became self-conscious. Occasionally she was indignant that she should always have to petition him for the money with which to buy his food. She caught herself criticizing his belief that, since his joke about trying to keep her out of the poorhouse had once been accepted as admirable humor, it should continue to be his daily bon mot. It was a nuisance to have to run down the street after him because she had forgotten to ask him for money at breakfast. But she couldn't hurt his feelings, she reflected. He liked the lordliness of giving largesse. She tried to reduce the frequency of begging by opening accounts and having the bills sent to him. She had found that staple groceries, sugar, flour, could be most cheaply purchased at Axel Eggie's rustic general store. She said sweetly to Axel, I think I'd better open a charge account here." "'I don't do no business except for cash,' grunted Axel. She flared. "'Do you know who I am?' "'Yeah, sure I know. The doc is good for it. But that's just the rule I made. I make low prices. I do business for cash.' She stared at his red, impassive face, and her fingers had the undignified desire to slap him, but her reason agreed with him. "'You're quite right. You shouldn't break your rule for me." Her rage had not been lost. It had been transferred to her husband. She wanted ten pounds of sugar in a hurry, but she had no money. She ran up the stairs to Kennicott's office. On the door was a sign advertising a headache cure and stating, The doctor is out, back at... Naturally, the blank space was not filled out. She stamped her foot. She ran down to the drug store, the doctor's club. As she entered she heard Mrs. Dyer demanding, "'Dave, I've got to have some money!' 
Carol saw that her husband was there, and two other men, all listening in amusement. Dave Dyer snapped, "'How much do you want? Dollar be enough?' "'No, it won't. I've got to get some underclothes for the kids.' "'Why, good Lord! They got enough now to fill the closet so I couldn't find my hunting boots last time I wanted them.' "'I don't care. They're all in rags. You've got to give me ten dollars.' Carol perceived that Mrs. Dyer was accustomed to this indignity. She perceived that the men, particularly Dave, regarded it as an excellent jest. She waited, she knew what would come. It did. Dave yelped, "'Where's that ten dollars I gave you last year?' And he looked to the other men to laugh. They laughed. Cold and still, Carol walked up to Kennicott and commanded, "'I want to see you upstairs.' "'Why, something the matter?' Yes. He clumped after her up the stairs into his barren office. Before he could get out a query, she stated, Yesterday, in front of a saloon, I heard a German farmwife beg her husband for a quarter to get a toy for the baby, and he refused. Just now I've heard Mrs. Dyer going through the same humiliation. And I, I'm in the same position. I have to beg you for money, daily. I have just been informed that I couldn't have any sugar because I hadn't the money to pay for it." "'Who said that? By God I'll kill any—' Tut! It wasn't his fault. It was yours. And mine. I now humbly beg you to give me the money with which to buy meals for you to eat, and hereafter to remember it. The next time I shan't beg. I shall simply starve. Do you understand? I can't go on being a slave." Her defiance. Her enjoyment of the role ran out. She was sobbing against his overcoat. "'How can you shame me so?' And he was blubbering. "'Doggone it! I meant to give you some, and I forgot it. I swear I won't again. By golly I won't!' He pressed fifty dollars upon her, and after that he remembered to give her money regularly, sometimes. Daily she determined, "'But I must have a stated amount. Be businesslike. System. I must do something about it." And daily she didn't do anything about it. 3. Mrs. Bogart had, by the simpering viciousness of her comments on the new furniture, stirred Carol to economy. She spoke judiciously to B about leftovers. She read the cookbook again, and, like a child with a picture-book, she studied the diagram of the beef which gallantly continues to browse though it is divided into cuts but she was a deliberate and joyous spendthrift in her preparations for her first party, the housewarming. She made lists on every envelope and laundry slip in her desk. She sent orders to Minneapolis fancy grocers. She pinned patterns and sewed. She was irritated when Kennicott was jocular about these frightful big doings that are going on. She regarded the affair as an attack on Gopher Prairie's timidity and pleasure. I'll make him lively, if nothing else. I'll make them stop regarding parties as committee meetings." Kennicott usually considered himself the master of the house. At his desire she went hunting, which was his symbol of happiness, and she ordered porridge for breakfast, which was his symbol of morality. But when he came home on the afternoon before the housewarming he found himself a slave, an intruder, a blunderer. Carol wailed, "'Fix the furnace so you won't have to touch it after supper and for heaven's sake take that horrible old doormat off the porch! And put on your nice brown and white shirt! Why did you come home so late? Would you mind hurrying? Here it is almost supper-time, and those fiends are just as likely as not to come at seven instead of eight. Please hurry!" She was as unreasonable as an amateur leading woman on a first night, and he was reduced to humility. When she came down to supper, when she stood in the doorway, he gasped. She was in a silver sheath, the calyx of a lily, her piled hair like black glass. She had the fragility and costliness of a Viennese goblet, and her eyes were intense. He was stirred to rise from the table to hold the chair for her, and all through supper he ate his bread dry because he felt that she would think him common if he said, "'Will you hand me the butter?' Four. She had reached the calmness of not caring whether her guests liked the party or not, and a state of satisfied suspense in regard to B's technique in serving, 
before Kennicott cried from the bay window in the living room, "'Here comes somebody!' and Mr. and Mrs. Luke Dawson faltered in, at a quarter to eight. Then in a shy avalanche arrived the entire aristocracy of Gopher Prairie, all persons engaged in a profession or earning more than twenty-five hundred dollars a year, or possessed of grandparents born in America. Even while they were moving their overshoes they were peeping at the new decorations. Carol saw Dave Dyer secretively turn over the gold pillows to find a price tag, and heard Mr. Julius Flickerbaugh, the attorney, gasp, "'Well, I'll be switched!' as he viewed the vermilion print hanging against the Japanese obi. She was amused, but her high spirit slackened as she beheld them form in dress parade, in a long, silent, uneasy circle clear round the living room. She felt that she had been magically whisked back to her first party at Sam Clark's. "'Have I got to lift them, like so many pigs of iron? I don't know that I can make them happy, but I'll make them hectic.' A silver flame in the darkling circle, she whirled around, drew them with her smile, and sang, "'I want my party to be noisy and undignified. This is the christening of my house, and I want you to help me have a bad influence on it, so that it will be a giddy house. For me, won't you all join in an old-fashioned square dance? And Mr. Dyer will call.' She had a record on the phonograph. Dave Dyer was capering in the center of the floor, loose-jointed, lean, small, rusty-headed, pointed of nose, clapping his hands and shouting, "'Swing your partners, Alleman, left!' Even the millionaire Dawsons and Ezra Stobody and Professor George Edwin Mott danced, looking only slightly foolish. And by rushing about the room and being coy and coaxing to all persons over forty-five, Carol got them into a waltz and a Virginia reel. But when she left them to disenjoy themselves in their own way, Harry Haydock put a one-step record on the phonograph, the younger people took the floor, and all the elders sneaked back to their chairs, with crystallized smiles which meant, "'Don't believe I'll try this one myself, but I do enjoy watching the youngsters dance.' Half of them were silent. Half resumed the discussions of that afternoon in the store. Ezra Stobody hunted for something to say hid a yawn, and offered to Lyman Cass, the owner of the flour mill, "'How do you folks like the new furnace, Lyme? Huh? So?' "'Oh, let them alone. Don't pester them. They must like it, or they wouldn't do it,' Carol warned herself. But they gazed at her so expectantly when she flickered past, that she was reconvinced that in their debauches of respectability they had lost the power of play as well as the power of impersonal thought. Even the dancers were gradually crushed by the invisible force of fifty perfectly pure and well-behaved and negative minds, and they sat down two by two. In twenty minutes the party was again elevated to the decorum of a prayer meeting. "'We're going to do something exciting,' Carol exclaimed to her new confidant, Vida Sherwin. She saw that in the growing quiet her voice had carried across the room. Nat Hicks, Ella Stobody, and Dave Dyer were abstracted fingers and lips slightly moving. She knew with a cold certainty that Dave was rehearsing his stunt about the Norwegian catching the hen, Ella running over the first lines of An Old Sweetheart of Mine, and Nat thinking of his popular parody on Mark Antony's oration. "'But I will not have anybody use the word stunt in my house,' she whispered to Miss Sherwin. "'That's good, I tell you. Why not have Raymond Weatherspoon sing?' Ramy? Why, my dear, he's the most sentimental yearner in town. See here, child, your opinions on house decorating are sound, but your opinions of people are rotten. Ramy does wag his tail, but the poor dear, longing for what he calls self-expression and no training in anything except selling shoes, but he can sing, and some day, when he gets away from Harry Haydock's patronage and ridicule, he'll do something fine. Carol apologized for her superciliousness. She urged Ramy and warned the planners of stunts. "'We all want you to sing, Mr. Weatherspoon. You're the only famous actor I'm going to let appear on the stage tonight.' While Ramy blushed and admitted, "'Oh, they don't want to hear me,' he was clearing his throat, pulling his clean handkerchief farther out of his breast pocket and thrusting his fingers between the buttons of his vest. In her affection for Ramy's defender, in her desire to discover artistic talent, Carol prepared to be delighted by the recital. 
Ramy sang, Fly as a bird, thou art my dove, and when the little swallow leaves its tiny nest, all in a reasonably bad offertory tenor. Carol was shuddering with the vicarious shame which sensitive people feel when they listen to an elocutionist being humorous, or to a precocious child publicly doing badly what no child should do at all. She wanted to laugh at the gratified importance in Ramy's half-shut eyes. She wanted to weep over the meek ambitiousness which clouded like an aura his pale face, flap ears, and sandy pompadour. She tried to look admiring, for the benefit of Miss Sherwin, that trusting admirer of all that was or conceivably could be the good, the true, and the beautiful. At the end of the third ornithological lyric, Miss Sherwin roused from her attitude of inspired vision and breathed to Carol, My, that was sweet. Of course, Raymond hasn't an unusually good voice, but don't you think he put such a lot of feeling into it? Carol lied blackly and magnificently, but without originality. Oh, yes, I do think he has so much feeling. She saw that after the strain of listening in a cultured manner the audience had collapsed, had given up their last hope of being amused. She cried, Now we're going to play an idiotic game which I learned in Chicago. You will have to take off your shoes for a starter. After that you will probably break your knees and shoulder blades. Much attention and incredulity a few eyebrows indicating a verdict that Dr. Kennicott's bride was noisy and improper. "'I shall choose the most vicious, like Juanita Haydock and myself as the shepherds. The rest of you are wolves. Your shoes are the sheep. The wolves go out into the hall. The shepherds scatter the sheep through this room, then turn off all the lights, and the wolves crawl in from the hall, and in the darkness they try to get the shoes away from the shepherds who are permitted to do anything except bite and use blackjacks. The wolves chuck the captured shoes out into the hall. No one excused. Come on, shoes off." Everyone looked at everyone else and waited for everyone else to begin. Carol kicked off her silver slippers and ignored the universal glance at her arches. The embarrassed but loyal Vida Sherwin unbuttoned her high black shoes. Ezra Stobody cackled, "Well." You're a terror to old folks. You're like the gals I used to go horseback riding with, back in the sixties. Ain't much accustomed to attending parties barefoot, but here goes." With a whoop and a gallant jerk Ezra snatched off his elastic-sided Congress shoes. The others giggled and followed. When the sheep had been penned up, in the darkness the timorous wolves crept into the living room squealing, halting, thrown out of their habit of stolidity by the strangeness of advancing through nothingness toward a waiting foe, a mysterious foe which expanded and grew more menacing. The wolves peered to make out landmarks, they touched gliding arms which did not seem to be attached to a body, they quivered with a rapture of fear. Reality had vanished. A yelping squabble suddenly rose, when Juanita Haydock's high titter and Guy Pollock's astonished, Ouch! Quit! You're scalping me!" Mrs. Luke Dawson galloped backward on stiff hands and knees into the safety of the lighted hallway, moaning, "'I declare, I never was so upset in my life!' But the propriety was shaken out of her, and she delightedly continued to ejaculate, "'Never in my life!' As she saw the living-room door opened by invisible hands and shoes hurling through it, as she heard from the darkness beyond the door a squalling, a bumping, a resolute, Here's a lot of shoes. Come on, you wolves! Ow! You would, would you?" When Carol abruptly turned on the lights in the embattled living room, half of the company were sitting back against the walls, where they had craftily remained throughout the engagement. But in the middle of the floor Kennicott was wrestling with Harry Haydock, their collars torn off, their hair in their eyes. And the owlish Mr. Julius Flickerbaugh was retreating from Juanita Haydock and gulping with unaccustomed laughter. Guy Pollock's discreet brown scarf hung down his back. Young Rita Simon's net blouse had lost two buttons, and betrayed more of her delicious plump shoulder than was regarded as pure in Gopher Prairie. Whether by shock, disgust, joy of combat, or physical activity, all the party were freed from their years of social decorum. George Edwin Mott giggled. Luke Dawson twisted his beard. Mrs. Clark insisted, I did too, Sam. I got a shoe. 
I never knew I could fight so terrible." Carol was certain that she was a great reformer. She mercifully had combs, mirrors, brushes, needle and thread ready. She permitted them to restore the divine decency of buttons. The grinning bee brought downstairs a pile of soft thick sheets of paper, with designs of lotus blossoms, dragons, apes, in cobalt and crimson and gray, and patterns of purple birds flying among sea-green trees in the valleys of nowhere. These, Carol announced, are real Chinese masquerade costumes. I got them from an importing shop in Minneapolis. You are to put them on over your clothes, and please forget that you are Minnesotans, and turn into mandarins and coolies and... and samurai, isn't it? And anything else you can think of." While they were shyly rustling the paper costumes, she disappeared. Ten minutes after, she gazed down from the stairs upon grotesquely ruddy Yankee heads above Oriental robes, and cried to them, the Princess Winkie Pooh salutes her court. As they looked up, she caught their suspense of admiration. They saw an airy figure in trousers and a coat of green brocade, edged with gold. A high gold collar under a proud chin, black hair pierced with jade pins, a languid peacock fan in an outstretched hand, eyes uplifted to a vision of pagoda towers. When she dropped her pose and smiled down she discovered Kennicott apoplectic with domestic pride, and gray Guy Pollock staring beseechingly. For a second she saw nothing in all the pink and brown mass of their faces save the hunger of the two men. She shook off the spell and ran down. "'We're going to have a real Chinese concert. Messrs. Pollock, Kennicott, and, well, Stowbody are drummers. The rest of us sing and play the fife.' The fifes were combs with tissue paper, the drums were tamborettes and the sewing table. Lauren Wheeler, editor of the Dauntless, led the orchestra, with a ruler and a totally inaccurate sense of rhythm. The music was a reminiscence of tom-toms heard at circus fortune-telling tents, or at the Minnesota State Fair, but the whole company pounded and puffed and whined in a sing-song and looked rapturous. Before they were quite tired of the concert, Carol led them in a dancing procession to the dining-room, to blue bowls of chow mein, with lychee nuts and ginger preserved in syrup. None of them, save that city-rounder Harry Haydock, had heard of any Chinese dish except chop suey. With agreeable doubt they ventured through the bamboo shoots into the golden fried noodles of the chow mein, and Dave Dyer did a not very humorous Chinese dance with Nat Hicks, and there was hubbub and contentment. Carol relaxed and found that she was shockingly tired. She had carried them on her thin shoulders. She could not keep it up. She longed for her father, that artist at creating hysterical parties. She thought of smoking a cigarette to shock them, and dismissed the obscene thought before it was quite formed. She wondered whether they could for five minutes be coaxed to talk about something besides the winter top of Canute Stamquist's Ford, and what Al Tingley had said about his mother-in-law. She sighed. Oh, let him alone. I've done enough. She crossed her trousered legs and snuggled luxuriously above her saucer of ginger. She caught Pollock's congratulatory still smile, and thought well of herself for having thrown a rose light on the pallid lawyer, repented the heretical supposition that any male save her husband existed, jumped up to find Kennicott and whisper, Happy, my lord? No, it didn't cost much best party this town ever saw. Only, don't cross your legs in that costume. Shows your knees too plain." She was vexed. She resented his clumsiness. She returned to Guy Pollock and talked of Chinese religions, not that she knew anything whatever about Chinese religions, but he had read a book on the subject, as on lonely evenings in his office, he had read at least one book on every subject in the world. Guy's thin maturity was changing in her vision to flushed youth, and they were roaming an island in the yellow sea of chatter when she realized that the guests were beginning that cough which indicated, in the universal instinctive language, that they desired to go home and go to bed. While they asserted that it had been the nicest party they'd ever seen, my, so clever and original, she smiled tremendously shook hands, and cried many suitable things regarding children, 
and being sure to wrap up warmly, and Raimi singing and Juanita Haydock's prowess at games. Then she turned wearily to Kennicott in a house filled with quiet and crumbs and shreds of Chinese costumes. He was gurgling. I tell you, Carrie, you certainly are a wonder, and guess you're right about waking folks up. Now you've showed em how, and they won't go on having the same old kind of parties and stunts and everything. Here, don't touch a thing. Done enough. Pop up to bed, and I'll clear up." His wise surgeon's hand stroked her shoulder, and her irritation at his clumsiness was lost in his strength. 5. From the Weekly Dauntless One of the most delightful social events of recent months was held Wednesday evening in the housewarming of Dr. and Mrs. Kennicott, who have completely redecorated their charming home on Poplar Street, and is now extremely nifty in modern color scheme. The doctor and his bride were at home to their numerous friends, and a number of novelties and diversions were held, including a Chinese orchestra in original and genuine Oriental costumes, of which Yi Editor was leader. Dainty refreshments were served in true Oriental style, and one and all voted a delightful time. 6. The week after, the Chet Dashaways gave a party. The circle of mourners kept its place all evening and Dave Dyer did the stunt of the Norwegian and the Hen. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 Of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 1. Gopher Prairie was digging in for the winter. Through late November and all December it snowed daily. The thermometer was at zero and might drop to twenty below, or thirty. Winter is not a season in the North Middle West, it is an industry. Storm sheds were erected at every door. In every block the householders, Sam Clark, the wealthy Mr. Dawson, all save asthmatic Ezra Stobody, who extravagantly hired a boy, were seen perilously staggering up ladders carrying storm windows and screwing them to second-story jams. While Kennicott put up his windows, Carol danced inside the bedrooms and begged him not to swallow the screws, which he held in his mouth like an extraordinary set of external false teeth. The universal sign of winter was the town handyman, Miles Bjornstam, a tall, thick, red-mustached bachelor, opinionated atheist, general store arguer, cynical Santa Claus. Children loved him, and he sneaked away from work to tell them improbable stories of seafaring and horse-trading and bears. The children's parents either laughed at him or hated him. He was the one Democrat in town. He called both Lyman Cass the Miller and the Finn homesteader from Lost Lake by their first names. He was known as the Red Swede and considered slightly insane. Bjornstam could do anything with his hands, solder a pan, weld an automobile spring, soothe a frightened filly, tinker a clock, carve a Gloucester schooner which magically went into a bottle. Now, for a week, he was Commissioner-General of Gopher Prairie. He was the only person besides the repairmen at Sam Clark's who understood plumbing. Everyone begged him to look over the furnace and the water pipes. He rushed from house to house till after bedtime, ten o'clock. Icicles from burst water pipes hung along the skirt of his brown dogskin overcoat. His plush cap, which he never took off in the house, was a pulp of ice and coal dust. His red hands were cracked to rawness. He chewed the stub of a cigar. But he was courtly to Carol. He stooped to examine the furnace flues. He straightened, glanced down at her, and hemmed, "'Got to fix your furnace, no matter what else I do.' The poor houses of Gopher Prairie, where the services of Miles Bjornstam were a luxury, which included the shanties of Miles Bjornstam, were banked to the lower windows with earth and manure. Along the railroad, the sections of snow fence, which had been stacked all summer in romantic wooden tents occupied by roving small boys, were set up to prevent drifts from covering the track. The farmers came into town in homemade sleighs with bed-quilts and hay piled in the rough boxes. Fur coats, fur caps, fur mittens, 
overshoes buckling almost to the knees, gray knitted scarfs ten feet long, thick woolen socks, canvas jackets lined with fluffy yellow wool like the plumage of ducklings, moccasins, red flannel wristlets for the blazing chapped wrists of boys. These protections against winter were busily dug out of mothball sprinkled drawers and tar bags in closets, and all over town small boys were squealing, Oh, there's my mittens! or Look at my shoe packs! There is so sharp a division between the panting summer and the stinging winter of the northern plains that they rediscovered with surprise and a feeling of heroism this armor of an Arctic explorer. Winter garments surpassed even personal gossip as the topic at parties. It was good form to ask, Put on your heavies yet? There were as many distinctions in wraps as in motor cars. The lesser sort appeared in yellow and black dogskin coats, but Kennicott was lordly in a long raccoon ulster and a new seal cap. When the snow was too deep for his motor, he went off on country calls in a shiny, floral, steel-tipped cutter, only his ruddy nose and his cigar emerging from the fur. Carol herself stirred Main Street by a loose coat of nutria. Her fingertips loved the silken fur. Her liveliest activity now was organizing outdoor sports in the motor-paralyzed town. The automobile and bridge whist had not only made more evident the social divisions in Gopher Prairie, but they had also enfeebled the love of activity. It was so rich-looking to sit and drive, and so easy. Skiing and sliding were stupid and old-fashioned. In fact, the village longed for the elegance of city recreations almost as much as the cities longed for village sports. And Gopher Prairie took as much pride in neglecting coasting as St. Paul or New York in going coasting. Carol did inspire a successful skating party in mid-November. Plover Lake glistened in clear sweeps of gray-green ice, ringing to the skates. On shore the ice-tipped reeds clattered in the wind and oak twigs with stubborn last leaves hung against a milky sky. Harry Haydock did a figure-eights, and Carol was certain that she had found the perfect life. But when snow had ended the skating and she tried to get up a moonlight sliding party, the matrons hesitated to stir away from their radiators and their daily bridge-whist imitations of the city. She had to nag them. They scooted down a long hill on a bobsled, they upset and got snow down their necks, they shrieked that they would do it again immediately, and they did not do it again at all. She badgered another group into going skiing. They shouted and threw snowballs, and informed her that it was such fun, and they'd have another skiing expedition right away, and they jollily returned home and never thereafter left their manuals of bridge. Carol was discouraged. She was grateful when Kennicott invited her to go rabbit-hunting in the woods. She waded down stilly cloisters between burnt stump and icy oak, through drifts marked with a million hieroglyphics of rabbit and mouse and bird. She squealed as he leaped on a pile of brush and fired at the rabbit which ran out. He belonged there, masculine in reefer and sweater and high-laced boots. That night she ate prodigiously of steak and fried potatoes. She produced electric sparks by touching his ear with her fingertip. She slept twelve hours, and awoke to think how glorious was this brave land. She rose to a radiance of sun on snow. Snug in her furs, she trotted uptown. Frosted shingles smoked against a sky colored like flax blossoms. Sleigh bells clinked, shouts of greeting were loud in the thin bright air and everywhere was a rhythmic sound of wood-sawing. It was Saturday, and the neighbor's sons were getting up the winter fuel. Behind walls of corded wood in backyards their sawbucks stood in depressions scattered with canary-yellow flakes of sawdust. The frames of their bucksaws were cherry-red, the blades blued steel, and the fresh-cut ends of the sticks, poplar, maple, ironwood, birch, were marked with engraved rings of growth. The boys wore shoe-packs, blue flannel shirts with enormous pearl buttons, and mackinaws of crimson, lemon-yellow, and foxy-brown. Carol cried fine day to the boys, 
She came in a glow to Howland and Gould's grocery, her collar white with frost from her breath. She bought a can of tomatoes as though it were orient fruit, and returned home planning to surprise Kennicott with an omelette creole for dinner. So brilliant was the snow glare that when she entered the house she saw the doorknobs, the newspaper on the table, every white surface as dazzling mauve, and her head was dizzy in the pyrotechnic dimness. When her eyes had recovered she felt expanded, drunk with health, mistress of life. The world was so luminous that she sat down at a rickety little desk in the living room to make a poem. She got no farther than, the sky is bright, the sun is warm, there ne'er will be another storm. In the mid-afternoon of this same day Kennicott was called into the country. It was Bee's evening out, her evening for the Lutheran dance. Carol was alone from three till midnight. She wearied of reading pure love stories in the magazines and sat by a radiator, beginning to brood. Thus she chanced to discover that she had nothing to do. 2. She had, she meditated, passed through the novelty of seeing the town and meeting people, of skating and sliding and hunting. B was competent, there was no household labor except sewing and darning and gossipy assistance to be in bed-making. She couldn't satisfy her ingenuity in planning meals. At Dahl and Olison's meat market you didn't give orders. You woefully inquired whether there was anything today besides steak and pork and ham. The cuts of beef were not cuts, they were hacks. Lamb chops were as exotic as shark's fins. The meat-dealers shipped their best to the city with its higher prices. In all the shops there was the same lack of choice. She could not find a glass-headed picture-nail in town. She did not hunt for the sort of veiling she wanted, she took what she could get, and only at Howland and Gould's was there such a luxury as canned asparagus. Routine care was all she could devote to the house. Only by such fussing as the widow Bogart's could she make it fill her time. She could not have outside employment. To the village doctor's wife it was taboo. She was a woman with a working brain and no work. There were only three things which she could do. Have children, start her career of reforming, or become so definitely a part of the town that she would be fulfilled by the activities of church and study club and bridge parties. Children, yes, she wanted them, but she was not quite ready. She had been embarrassed by Kennicott's frankness, but she agreed with him that in the insane condition of civilization, which made the rearing of citizens more costly and perilous than any other crime, it was inadvisable to have children till he had made more money. She was sorry. Perhaps he had made all the mystery of love a mechanical cautiousness, but she fled from the thought with a dubious, some day. Her reforms, her impulses toward beauty in raw Main Street, they had become indistinct. But she would set them going now. She would. She swore it with soft fist beating the edges of the radiator. And at the end of all her vows she had no notion as to when and where the crusade was to begin. Become an authentic part of the town? She began to think with unpleasant lucidity. She reflected that she did not know whether the people liked her. She had gone to the women at afternoon coffees, to the merchants in their stores, and with so many outpouring comments and whimsies that she hadn't given them a chance to betray their opinions of her. The men smiled, but did they like her? She was lively among the women, but was she one of them? She could not recall many times when she had been admitted to the whisperings of scandal which is the secret chamber of Gopher Prairie conversation. She was poisoned with doubt as she drooped up to bed. Next day, through her shopping, her mind sat back and observed. Dave Dyer and Sam Clark were as cordial as she had been fancying. But wasn't there an impersonal abruptness in the how are ya? of Chet Dashaway? Howland the grocer was curt. Was that merely his usual manner? It's infuriating to have to pay attention to what people think. In St. Paul I didn't care. 
But here I'm spied on. They're watching me." I mustn't let it make me self-conscious, she coaxed herself, overstimulated by the drug of thought and offensively on the defensive. 3. A thaw which stripped the snow from the sidewalks, a ringing iron night when the lakes could be heard booming, a clear roistering morning. In tam and tweed skirt Carol felt herself a college junior going out to play hockey. She wanted to whoop, her legs ached to run. On the way home from shopping she yielded, as a pup would have yielded. She galloped down a block, and as she jumped from a curb across a welter of slush she gave a student, Yippee! She saw that in a window three old women were gasping. Their triple glare was paralyzing. Across the street, at another window, the curtain had secretively moved. She stopped, walked on sedately, changed from the girl Carol into Mrs. Dr. Kennicott. She never again felt quite young enough and defiant enough and free enough to run and halloo in the public streets, and it was as a nice married woman that she attended the next weekly bridge of the Jolly Seventeen. 4. The Jolly Seventeen, the membership of which ranged from fourteen to twenty-six, was the social cornice of Gopher Prairie. It was the country club, the diplomatic set, the St. Cecilia, the Ritz Oval Room, the Club de Vant. To belong to it was to be in. Though its membership partly coincided with that of the Thanatopsis Study Club, the Jolly Seventeen as a separate entity guffawed at the Thanatopsis and considered it middle class and even highbrow. Most of the Jolly Seventeen were young married women, with their husbands as associate members. Once a week they had a women's afternoon bridge. Once a month the husbands joined them for supper and evening bridge. Twice a year they had dances at the I.O.O.F. Hall. Then the town exploded. Only at the annual balls of the firemen and of the Eastern Star was there such a prodigality of chiffon scarfs and tangoing and heart-burnings, and these rival institutions were not select. Hired girls attended the firemen's ball, with section hands and laborers. Ella Stobody had once gone to a jolly seventeen soiree in the village hack, hitherto confined to chief mourners at funerals. And Harry Haydock and Dr. Terry Gould always appeared in the town's only specimens of evening clothes. The afternoon bridge of the Jolly Seventeen, which followed Carol's lonely doubting, was held at Juanita Haydock's new concrete bungalow, with its door of polished oak and beveled plate glass, jar of ferns in the plastered hall, and in the living room a fumed oak morris chair, sixteen color prints, and a square varnished table with a mat made of cigar ribbons on which was one illustrated gift edition and one pack of cards in a burnt leather case. Carol stepped into a scirocco of furnace heat. They were already playing. Despite her flabby resolves, she had not yet learned bridge. She was winningly apologetic about it to Anita, and ashamed that she should have to go on being apologetic. Mrs. Dave Dyer, a sallow woman with a thin prettiness devoted to experiments in religious cults, illnesses, and scandal-bearing, shook her finger at Carol and trilled, "'You're a naughty one. I don't believe you appreciate the honor when you got into the Jolly Seventeen so easy.' Mrs. Chet Dashaway nudged her neighbor at the second table. But Carol kept up the appealing bridal manner so far as possible. She twittered, you're perfectly right. I'm a lazy thing. I'll make Will start teaching me this very evening." Her supplication had all the sound of birdies in the nest, and Easter church bells and frosted Christmas cards. Internally she snarled, "'That ought to be saccharine enough.' She sat in the smallest rocking-chair, a model of Victorian modesty. But she saw, or she imagined, that the women who had gurgled at her so welcomingly when she had first come to Gopher Prairie were nodding at her brusquely. During the pause after the first game she petitioned Mrs. Jackson Elder, "'Don't you think we ought to get up another bobsled party soon?' "'It's so cold when you get dumped in the snow,' 
said Mrs. Elder indifferently. "'I hate snow down my neck,' volunteered Mrs. Dave Dyer, with an unpleasant look at Carol, and turning her back she bubbled at Rita Simons, "'Dearie, won't you run in this evening? I've got the loveliest new butterick pattern I want to show you.' Carol crept back to her chair. In the fervor of discussing the game they ignored her. She was not used to being a wallflower. She struggled to keep from oversensitiveness, from becoming unpopular by the sure method of believing that she was unpopular. But she had much reserve of patience, and at the end of the second game, when Ella Stobody sniffily asked her, "'Are you going to send to Minneapolis for your dress for the next soiree? Heard you were,' Carol said. "'Don't know yet,' with unnecessary sharpness. She was relieved by the admiration with which the jeune field Rita Simons looked at the steel buckles on her pumps, but she resented Mrs. Howland's tart demand. "'Don't you find that new couch of yours is too broad to be practical?' She nodded, then shook her head, and touchily left Mrs. Howland to get out of it any meaning she desired. Immediately she wanted to make peace. She was close to simpering in the sweetness with which she addressed Mrs. Howland. I think that is the prettiest display of beef tea your husband has in his store." "'Oh, yes, Gopher Prairie isn't so much behind the times,' jibed Mrs. Howland. Someone giggled. Their rebuffs made her haughty. Her haughtiness irritated them to franker rebuffs. They were working up to a state of painfully righteous war when they were saved by the coming of food. Though Juanita Haydock was highly advanced in the matters of finger-bowls, doilies, and bath-mats, her refreshments were typical of all the afternoon coffees. Juanita's best friends, Mrs. Dyer and Mrs. Dashaway, passed large dinner-plates, each with a spoon, a fork, and a coffee-cup without a saucer. They apologized and discussed the afternoon's game as they passed through the thicket of women's feet. Then they distributed hot buttered rolls coffee poured from an enamelware pot, stuffed olives, potato salad, and angel's food cake. There was, even in the most strictly conforming gopher prairie circles, a certain option as to collations. The olives need not be stuffed. Doughnuts were in some houses well thought of as a substitute for the hot buttered rolls. But there was in all the town no heretic save Carol who omitted angel's food. They ate enormously. Carol had a suspicion that the thriftier housewives made the afternoon treat due for evening supper. She tried to get back into the current. She edged over to Mrs. McGannum. Chunky, amiable, young Mrs. McGannum with her breast and arms of a milkmaid, and her loud delayed laugh which burst startling from a sober face, was the daughter of old Dr. Westlake and the wife of Westlake's partner, Dr. McGannum. Kennicott asserted that Westlake and McGannum and their contaminated families were tricky, but Carol had found them gracious. She asked for friendliness by crying to Mrs. McGannum, "'How is the baby's throat now?' and she was attentive while Mrs. McGannum rocked and knitted and placidly described symptoms. Vida Sherwin came in after school, with Miss Ethel Villets, the town librarian. Miss Sherwin's optimistic presence gave Carol more confidence. She talked. She informed the circle, "'I drove almost down to Joaquinan with Will a few days ago. Isn't the country lovely? And I do admire the Scandinavian farmers down there so, their big red barns and silos and milking machines and everything. Do you all know that lonely Lutheran church, with the tin-covered spire that stands out alone on a hill? It's so bleak, somehow it seems so brave.' I do think the Scandinavians are the hardiest and best people." "'Oh, do you think so?' protested Mrs. Jackson Elder. "'My husband says the Svenskas that work in the planing mill are perfectly terrible, so silent and cranky and so selfish, the way they keep demanding raises. If they had their way they'd simply ruin the business.' "'Yes, and they're simply ghastly hired girls,' wailed Mrs. Dave Dyer. I swear I work myself to skin and bone trying to please my hired girls, when I can get them. I do everything in the world for them. They can have their gentlemen friends call on them in the kitchen any time, and they get just the same to eat as we do, 
if there's any left over, and I practically never jump on them." Juanita Haydock rattled. They're ungrateful, all that class of people. I do think the domestic problem is simply becoming awful. I don't know what the country's coming to, with these Scandahoofian clodhoppers demanding every cent you can save, and so ignorant and impertinent, and on my word, demanding bathtubs and everything, as if they weren't mighty good and lucky at home if they got a bath in the washtub." They were off, riding hard. Carol thought of B and waylaid them. But isn't it possibly the fault of the mistresses if the maids are ungrateful? For generations we've given them the leavings of food and holes to live in. I don't want to boast, but I must say I don't have much trouble with B. She's so friendly. The Scandinavians are sturdy and honest." Mrs. Dave Dyer snapped. "'Honest? Do you call it honest to hold us up for every cent of pay they can get? I can't say that I've had any of them steal anything, though you might call it stealing to eat so much that a roast of beef hardly lasts three days. But just the same, I don't intend to let them think they can put anything over on me. I always make them pack and unpack their trunks downstairs, right under my eyes, and then I know they aren't being tempted to dishonesty by any slackness on my part." "'How much do the maids get here?' Carol ventured. Mrs. B. J. Gougerling, wife of the banker, stated in a shocked manner, "'Any place from three-fifty to five-fifty a week. I know positively that Mrs. Clark, after swearing that she wouldn't weaken and encourage them in their outrageous demands, went and paid five-fifty. Think of it! Practically a dollar a day for unskilled work, and, of course, her food and room and a chance to do her own washing right in with the rest of the wash. How much do you pay, Mrs. Kennicott?" "'Yes, how much do you pay?' insisted half a dozen. "'Why, I pay six a week,' she feebly confessed. They gasped. Juanita protested. "'Don't you think it's hard on the rest of us when you pay so much?' Juanita's demand was reinforced by universal glower. Carol was angry. "'I don't care. A maid has one of the hardest jobs on earth. She works from ten to eighteen hours a day. She has to wash slimy dishes and dirty clothes. She tends the children and runs to the door with wet chapped hands, and—' Mrs. Dave Dyer broke into Carol's peroration with a furious, "'That's all very well, but believe me, I do those things myself when I'm without a maid, and that's a good share of the time for a person that isn't willing to yield and pay exorbitant wages." Carol was retorting, "'But a maid does it for strangers, and all she gets out of it is the pay.' Their eyes were hostile. Four of them were talking at once. Vida Sherwin's dictatorial voice cut through, took control of the revolution. "'Tut, tut, tut, tut! What angry passions! And what an idiotic discussion! All of you are getting too serious. Stop it! Carol Kennicott, you're probably right, but you're too much ahead of the times. Juanita, quit looking so belligerent. What is this, a card party or a hen fight? Carol, you stop admiring yourself as the Joan of Arc of the hired girls, or I'll spank you. You come over here and talk libraries with Ethel Villets. Boo! If there's any more pecking, I'll take charge of the hen roost myself." They all laughed artificially, and Carol obediently talked libraries. A small-town bungalow, the wives of a village doctor and a village dry-goods merchant, a provincial teacher, a colloquial brawl over paying a servant a dollar more a week. Yet this insignificance echoed cellar plots and cabinet meetings and labor conferences in Persia and Prussia, Rome and Boston and the orators who deemed themselves international leaders were but the raised voices of a billion Juanitas denouncing a million carols, with a hundred thousand Vida Sherwins trying to shoo away the storm. Carol felt guilty. She devoted herself to admiring the spinsterish Miss Villets, and immediately committed another offense against the laws of decency. "'We haven't seen you at the library yet,' Miss Villets reproved. I've wanted to run in so much, but I've been getting settled and—I'll probably come in so often you'll get tired of me. I hear you have such a nice library. There are many who like it. 
we have two thousand more books than what came in. Isn't that fine? I'm sure you are largely responsible. I've had some experience in St. Paul. So I have been informed. Not that I entirely approve of library methods in these large cities. So careless, letting tramps and all sorts of dirty persons practically sleep in the reading-rooms. I know, but the poor souls. Well, I'm sure you will agree with me in one thing. The chief task of a librarian is to get people to read. You feel so? My feeling, Mrs. Kennicott, and I am merely quoting the librarian of a very large college, is that the first duty of the conscientious librarian is to preserve the books. Oh! Carol repented her O. Oh. Miss Villet stiffened and attacked. It may be all very well in cities, where they have unlimited funds, to let nasty children ruin books and just deliberately tear them up, and fresh young men take more books out than they are entitled to by the regulations, but I'm never going to permit it in this library. What if some children are destructive? They learn to read. Books are cheaper than mines. Nothing is cheaper than the minds of some of these children that come in and bother me simply because their mothers don't keep them home where they belong. Some librarians may choose to be so wishy-washy and turn their libraries into nursing homes and kindergartens, but as long as I'm in charge, the Gopher Prairie Library is going to be quiet and decent, and the books well kept." Carol saw that the others were listening, waiting for her to be objectionable. She flinched before their dislike. She hastened to smile in agreement with Miss Villets, to glance publicly at her wristwatch, to warble that it was, so late, have to hurry home, husband, such nice party, maybe you were right about maids, prejudiced because be so nice. Such perfectly divine angel's food Mrs. Haydock must give me the recipe. Good-bye, such happy party." She walked home. She reflected, It was my fault. I was touchy. And I opposed them so much. Only— I can't. I can't be one of them if I must damn all the maids toiling in filthy kitchens, all the ragged, hungry children. And these women are to be my arbiters, the rest of my life. She ignored B's call from the kitchen. She ran upstairs to the unfrequented guest-room. She wept in terror, her body a pale arc as she knelt beside a cumbrous black walnut bed, beside a puffy mattress covered with a red quilt, in a shuttered and airless room. End of chapter 7「Don't I, in looking for things to do, show that I'm not attentive enough to Will? Am I impressed enough by his work? I will be, oh, I will be, if I can't be one of the town, if I must be an outcast. When Kennicott came home she bustled, "'Dear, you must tell me a lot more about your cases. I want to know. I want to understand.' "'Sure, you bet.' And he went down to fix the furnace. At supper she asked, "'For instance, what did you do today?' "'Do today? How do you mean?' "'Medically. I want to understand.' "'Today? Oh, there wasn't much of anything. Couple chumps with belly aches and a sprained wrist, and a fool woman that thinks she wants to kill herself because her husband doesn't like her, and just routine work. But the unhappy woman doesn't sound routine. Her? Just case of nerves. We can't do much with these marriage mix ups. But, dear, please, will you tell me about the next case that you do think is interesting? Sure, you bet. Tell you about anything that. Say, that's pretty good salmon. Get it at Howland's? 2. Four days after the Jolly Seventeen debacle, Vida Sherwin called and casually blew Carol's world to pieces. May I come in and gossip a while? she said, with such excess of bright innocence that Carol was uneasy. Vida took off her furs with a bounce, she sat down as though it were a gymnasium exercise 
she flung out. Feel disgracefully good, this weather. Raymond Weatherspoon says if he had my energy he'd be a grand opera singer. I always think this climate is the finest in the world, and my friends are the dearest people in the world, and my work is the most essential thing in the world. Probably I fool myself. But I know one thing for certain. You're the pluckiest little idiot in the world." And so you are about to flay me alive. Carol was cheerful about it. Am I? Perhaps. I've been wondering. I know that the third party to a squabble is often the most to blame, the one who runs between A and B having a beautiful time telling each of them what the other has said. But I want you to take a big part in vitalizing Gopher Prairie, and so such a very unique opportunity and am I silly? I know what you mean. I was too abrupt at the Jolly Seventeen. It isn't that. Matter of fact, I'm glad you told them some wholesome truths about servants, though perhaps you were just a bit tactless. It's bigger than that. I wonder if you understand that in a secluded community like this every newcomer is on test, people cordial to her but watching her all the time. I remember when a Latin teacher came here from Wellesley they resented her broad A. We're sure it was affected. Of course, they have discussed you. Have they talked about me much? My dear! I always feel as though I walked around in a cloud, looking out at others but not being seen. I feel so inconspicuous and so normal, so normal that there's nothing about me to discuss. I can't realize that Mr. and Mrs. Haydock must gossip about me." Carol was working up a small passion of distaste. And I don't like it. It makes me crawly to think of their daring to talk over all I do and say, pawing me over. I resent it. I hate—wait, child, perhaps they resent some things in you. I want you to try and be impersonal. They'd paw over anybody who came in new. Didn't you, with newcomers in college?" Yes. Well, then, will you be impersonal? I'm paying you the compliment of supposing that you can be. I want you to be big enough to help me make this town worth while. I'll be as impersonal as cold boiled potatoes. Not that I shall ever be able to help you make the town worth while. What do they say about me, really, I want to know? Of course the illiterate ones resent your references to anything farther away than Minneapolis. They're so suspicious. That's it, suspicious. And some think you dress too well." Oh, they do, do they? Shall I dress in gunny-sacking to suit them? Please, are you going to be a baby? I'll be good, sulkily. You certainly will, or I won't tell you one single thing. You must understand this. I'm not asking you to change yourself, just want you to know what they think. You must do that, no matter how absurd their prejudices are, if you're going to handle them. Is it your ambition to make this a better town, or isn't it?" I don't know whether it is or not. Why, why, tut, tut now, of course it is. Why, I depend on you. You're a born reformer. I am not, not any more. Of course you are. Oh, if I really could help! So they think I'm affected? My lamb, they do! Now don't say they're nervy. After all, Gopher Prairie standards are as reasonable to Gopher Prairie as Lakeshore Drive standards are to Chicago, and there's more Gopher Prairies than there are Chicago's, or London's. And I'll tell you the whole story. They think you're showing off when you say American instead of American. They think you're too frivolous. Life's so serious to them that they can't imagine any kind of laughter except Juanita's snortling. Ethel Villets was sure you were patronizing her when, oh, I was not! You talked about encouraging reading. And Mrs. Elder thought you were patronizing when you said she had such a pretty little car. She thinks it's an enormous car and some of the merchants say you're too flip when you talk to them in the store, and, poor me, when I was trying to be friendly. Every housewife in town is doubtful about your being so chummy with your bee. All right to be kind, but they say you act as though she were your cousin. 
Wait now, there's plenty more. And they think you were eccentric in furnishing this room. They think the broad couch and that Japanese dingus are absurd. Wait, I know, they're silly. And I guess I've heard a dozen criticize you because you don't go to church oftener, and— I can't stand it. I can't bear to realize that they've been saying all these things while I've been going about so happily and liking them. I wonder if you ought to have told me. It will make me self-conscious. I wonder the same thing. Only answer I can get is the old saw about knowledge being power. And some day you'll see how absorbing it is to have power, even here, to control the town. Oh, I'm a crank, but I do like to see things moving. It hurts. It makes these people seem so beastly and treacherous when I've been perfectly natural with them. But let's have it all. What did they say about my Chinese housewarming party? Why, um, go on, or I'll make up worse things than anything you can tell me. They did enjoy it, but I guess some of them felt you were showing off, pretending that your husband is richer than he is. I can't. Their meanness of mind is beyond any horrors I could imagine. They really thought that I— and you want to reform people like that when dynamite is so cheap? Who dared to say that, the rich or the poor? Fairly well assorted. Can't they at least understand me well enough to see that, though I might be affected and culturine, at least I simply couldn't commit that other kind of vulgarity? If they must know, you may tell them, with my compliments, that Will makes about four thousand a year, and the party cost half of what they probably thought it did. Chinese things are not very expensive, and I made my own costume. Stop it! Stop beating me! I know all that. What they meant was, they felt you were starting dangerous competition by giving a party such as most people here can't afford. Four thousand is a pretty big income for this town. I never thought of starting competition. Will you believe that it was in all love and friendliness that I tried to give them the gayest party I could? It was foolish, it was childish and noisy, but I did mean it so well. I know, of course, and it certainly is unfair of them to make fun of your having that Chinese food, chow men was it, and to laugh about your wearing those pretty trousers." Carol sprang up, whimpering. Oh, they didn't do that! They didn't poke fun at my feast, that I ordered so carefully for them, and my little Chinese costume that I was so happy making. I made it secretly to surprise them. And they've been ridiculing it all this while." She was huddled on the couch. Vida was stroking her hair, muttering, "'I shouldn't.' Shrouded in shame, Carol did not know when Vida slipped away. The clock's bell, at half-past five, aroused her. "'I must get hold of myself before Will comes. I hope he never knows what a fool his wife is frozen, sneering, horrible hearts. Like a very small, very lonely girl, she trudged upstairs, slow step by step, her feet dragging, her hand on the rail. It was not her husband to whom she wanted to run for protection, it was her father, her smiling, understanding father, dead these twelve years. 3. Kennicott was yawning stretched in the largest chair between the radiator and a small kerosene stove. Cautiously, "'Will, dear, I wonder if the people here don't criticize me sometimes. They must. I mean, if they ever do, you mustn't let it bother you.' "'Criticize you? Lord, I should say not. They all keep telling me you're the swellest girl they ever saw.' "'Well, I've just fancied—' The merchants probably think I'm too fussy about shopping. I'm afraid I bore Mr. Dashaway and Mr. Howland and Mr. Ludelmeyer. I can tell you how that is. I didn't want to speak of it, but since you brought it up, Chet Dashaway probably resents the fact that you got this new furniture down in the cities instead of here. I didn't want to raise any objection at the time, but, after all, I make my money here, and they naturally expect me to spend it here. If Mr. Dashaway will kindly tell me how any civilized person can furnish a room out of the mortuary pieces that he calls—' She remembered. She said meekly, "'But I understand.' 
And Howlin and Ludelmeyer? Oh, you've probably handed them a few rows for the bum stocks they carry, when you just meant to jolly them. But rats, what do we care? This is an independent town, not like these eastern holes where you have to watch your step all the time and live up to fool demands and social customs, and a lot of old tabbies always busy criticizing. Everybody's free here to do what he wants to." He said it with a flourish, and Carol perceived that he believed it. She turned her breath of fury into a yawn. "'By the way, Carrie, while we're talking of this, of course I like to keep independent, and I don't believe in this business of binding yourself to trade with the man that trades with you, unless you really want to, but same time, I'd be just as glad if you dealt with Jensen or Ludelmeyer as much as you can, instead of Howlin' and Gould, who go to Dr. Gould every last time, and the whole tribe of them the same way. I don't see why I should be paying out my good money for groceries and having them pass it on to Terry Gould." "'I've gone to Howlin' and Gould because they're better and cleaner. I know. I don't mean cut them out entirely. Of course, Jensen is tricky. Give you short weight. And Ludelmeyer is a shiftless old Dutch hog. But, same time, I mean, let's keep the trade in the family whenever it is convenient. See how I mean?" I see. Well. Guess it's about time to turn in." He yawned, went out to look at the thermometer, slammed the door, patted her head, unbuttoned his waistcoat, yawned, wound the clock, went down to look at the furnace, yawned, and clumped upstairs to bed, casually scratching his thick woolen undershirt. Till he bawled, "'Aren't you ever coming up to bed?' She sat unmoving. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of Main Street by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine. One. She had tripped into the meadow to teach the lambs a pretty educational dance, and found that the lambs were wolves. There was no way out between their pressing gray shoulders. She was surrounded by fangs and sneering eyes. She could not go on enduring the hidden derision. She wanted to flee. She wanted to hide in the generous indifference of cities. She practiced saying to Kennicott, "'Think perhaps I'll run down to St. Paul for a few days.' But she could not trust herself to say it carelessly, could not abide his certain questioning. Reform the town? All she wanted was to be tolerated. She could not look directly at people. She flushed and winced before citizens, who a week ago had been amusing objects of study and in their good mornings she heard a cruel sniggering. She encountered Juanita Haydock at old Jensen's grocery. She besought, "'Oh, how do you do? Heavens, what beautiful celery that is!' "'Yes, doesn't it look fresh? Harry simply has to have his celery on Sunday, drat the man!' Carol hastened out of the shop, exulting. "'She did make fun of me. Did she?' "'In a week. She had recovered from consciousness of insecurity, of shame and whispering notoriety, but she kept her habit of avoiding people. She walked the streets with her head down. When she spied Mrs. McGannum or Mrs. Dyer ahead, she crossed over with an elaborate pretense of looking at a billboard. Always she was acting, for the benefit of every one she saw, and for the benefit of the ambushed leering eyes which she did not see. She perceived that Vida Sherwin had told the truth. Whether she entered a store, or swept the back porch, or stood at the bay window in the living room, the village peeped at her. Once she had swung along the street triumphant in making a home. Now she glanced at each house and felt, when she was safely home, that she had won past a thousand enemies armed with ridicule. She told herself that her sensitiveness was preposterous, but daily she was thrown into panic. She saw curtains slide back into innocent smoothness. Old women who had been entering their houses slipped out again to stare at her. In the wintry quiet she could hear them tiptoeing on their porches. When she had for a blessed hour forgotten the searchlight, when she was scampering through a chill dusk, happy in yellow windows against gray night, her heart checked as she realized that a head covered with a shawl was thrust up over a snow-tipped bush to watch her. She admitted that she was taking herself too seriously, that villagers gape at everyone. 
She became placid, and thought well of her philosophy. But next morning she had a shock of shame as she entered Ludemeyer's. The grocer, his clerk, and erotic Mrs. Dave Dyer had been giggling about something. They halted, looked embarrassed, babbled about onions. Carol felt guilty. That evening, when Kennicott took her to call on the crotchety Lyman Casses, their host seemed flustered at their arrival. Kennicott jovially hooted, "'What makes you so hang-dog, Lyme?' The Casses tittered feebly. Except Dave Dyer, Sam Clark, and Ramey Weatherspoon, there were no merchants of whose welcome Carol was certain. She knew that she read mockery into greetings, but she could not control her suspicion, could not rise from her psychic collapse. She alternately raged and flinched at the superiority of the merchants. They did not know that they were being rude, but they meant to have it understood that they were prosperous and not scared of no doctor's wife. They often said, One man's as good as another, and a darn sight better. This motto, however, they did not commend to farmer customers who had had crop failures. The Yankee merchants were crabbed, and old Jensen, Ludelmeyer, and Gus Dahl from the old country wished to be taken for Yankees. James Madison Howland, born in New Hampshire, and old Jensen, born in Sweden, both proved that they were free American citizens by grunting, I don't know whether I got any or not, or, well, you can't expect me to get it delivered by noon. It was good form for the customers to fight back. Juanita Haydock cheerfully jabbered, You have it there by twelve, or I'll snatch that fresh delivery boy bald-headed. But Carol had never been able to play the game of friendly rudeness, and now she was certain that she never would learn it. She formed the cowardly habit of going to Axel Eggie's. Axel was not respectable and rude. He was still a foreigner, and he expected to remain one. His manner was heavy and uninterrogative. His establishment was more fantastic than any crossroads store. No one save Axel himself could find anything. A part of the assortment of children's stockings was under a blanket on a shelf, a part in a tin ginger-snap box, the rest heaped like a nest of black cotton snakes upon a flour-barrel, which was surrounded by brooms, Norwegian Bibles, dried codford lutefisk, boxes of apricots, and a pair and a half of lumbermen's rubber-footed boots. The place was crowded with Scandinavian farm-wives, standing aloof in shawls, and ancient fawn-colored leg of mutton jackets, awaiting the return of their lords. They spoke Norwegian or Swedish, and looked at Carol uncomprehendingly. They were a relief to her. They were not whispering that she was a poseur. But what she told herself was that Axel Eggie's was so picturesque and romantic. It was in the matter of clothes that she was most self-conscious. When she dared to go shopping in her new checked suit with the black embroidered sulphur collar, she had as good as invited all of Grofer Prairie, which interested itself in nothing so intimately as in new clothes and the cost thereof, to investigate her. It was a smart suit with lines unfamiliar to the dragging yellow and pink frocks of the town. The widow Bogart's stare from her porch indicated, "'Well, I never saw anything like that before.' Mrs. McGannum stopped Carol at the notion shop to hint, "'My, that's a nice suit. Wasn't it terribly expensive?' The gang of boys in front of the drug store commented, "'Hey, Pudgy! Play your game of checkers on that dress!' Carol could not endure it. She drew her fur coat over the suit and hastily fastened the buttons, while the boy snickered. 2. No group angered her quite so much as these staring young roués. She had tried to convince herself that the village, with its fresh air, its lakes for fishing and swimming, was healthier than the artificial city, but she was sickened by the glimpses of the gang of boys from fourteen to twenty who loafed before Dyer's drug store smoking cigarettes, displaying fancy shoes and purple ties and coats of diamond-shaped buttons, whistling the hoochie-coochie and catcalling, "'Oh, you baby doll!' at every passing girl. She saw them playing pool in the stinking room behind Del Snafflin's barber shop, and shaking dice in the smokehouse, and gathered in a snickering knot to listen to the juicy stories of Bert Tybee, the bartender of the Minnie Mashie house. She heard them smacking moist lips over every love scene at the Rosebud Movie Palace. 
at the counter of the Greek confectionery parlor, where they ate dreadful messes of decayed bananas, acid cherries, whipped cream and gelatinous ice cream, they screamed to one another, "'Hey, let me alone! Quit, doggone you! Look at what you'd went and done! You almost spilled my glass water! Like hell I did! Hey, gall darn your hide, don't you go sticking your coffin nail in my ice cream! Oh, you, Batty, how'd you like dancing with Tilly McGuire last night? Some squeezing, eh, kid? By diligent consultation of American fiction, she discovered that this was the only virile and amusing manner in which boys could function, that boys who were not compounded of the gutter and the mining camp were mollycoddles and unhappy. She had taken this for granted. She had studied the boys pityingly but impersonally. It had not occurred to her that they might touch her. Now she was aware that they knew all about her, that they were waiting for some affectation over which they could guffaw. No schoolgirl passed their observation posts more flushingly than did Mrs. Dr. Kennicott. In shame she knew that they glanced appraisingly at her snowy overshoes, speculating about her legs. Theirs were not young eyes. There was no youth in all the town, she agonized. They were born old, grim and old and spying and censorious. She cried again that their youth was senile and cruel on the day when she overheard Cy Bogart and Earl Haydock. Cyrus N. Bogart, son of the righteous widow who lived across the alley, was at this time a boy of fourteen or fifteen. Carol had already seen quite enough of Cy Bogart. On her first evening in Gopher Prairie, Cy had appeared at the head of a charivari, banging immensely upon a discarded automobile fender. His companions were yelping in imitation of coyotes. Kennicott had felt rather complimented, had gone out and distributed a dollar. But Cy was a capitalist in charivaries. He returned with an entirely new group, and this time there were three automobile fenders and a carnival rattle. When Kennicott again interrupted his shaving, Cy piped, "'Nah, you got to give us two dollars!' And he got it. A week later, Cy rigged a tic-tac to a window of the living room, and that tattoo out of the darkness frightened Carol into screaming. Since then, in four months, she had beheld Cy hanging a cat, stealing melons, throwing tomatoes at the Kennicott house, and making skeet tracks across the lawn, and had heard him explaining the mysteries of generation, with great audibility and dismaying knowledge. He was, in fact, a museum specimen of what a small town, a well-disciplined public school, a tradition of hearty humor, and a pious mother could produce from the material of a courageous and ingenious mind. Carol was afraid of him. Far from protesting when he set his mongrel on a kitten, she worked hard at not seeing him. The Kennicott garage was a shed littered with paint cans, tools, a lawn mower, and ancient wisps of hay. Above it was a loft which Cy Bogart and Earl Haydock, young brother of Harry, used as a den, for smoking, hiding from whippings, and planning secret societies. They climbed to it by a ladder on the alley side of the shed. This morning of late January, two or three weeks after Vida's revelations, Carol had gone into the stable garage to find a hammer. Snow softened her step. She heard voices in the loft above her. Oh, gee! Les! Oh, let's go down the lake and swipe some mushrats out of somebody's traps! Sigh was yawning. And get our ears beat off, grumbled Earl Haydock. Gosh, these cigarettes are dandy! Remember when we were just kids and used to smoke corn silk and hayseed? Yup, gosh! Spit. Silence. Say, Earl, Ma says if you chew tobacco you get consumption. Ah, rats, your old lady is a crank. Yeah, that's so. Pause. But she says she knows a feller that did. Aw, oh, gee whiz, didn't Doc Kennicott used to chew tobacco all the time before he married this here girl from the cities? He used to spit. Gee, some shot. He could hit a tree ten feet off." This was news to the girl from the cities. "'Say, how is she?' continued Earl. "'Huh. How's who? You know who I mean. Smarty.' A tussle, a thumping of loose boards, silence, weary narration from Cy. "'Mrs. Kennicott? 
Oh, she's all right, I guess. Relieved to Carol below. She gimme hunk a cake one time, but Ma says she's stuck up as hell. Ma's always talking about her. Ma says if Mrs. Kennicott thought as much about the doc as she does about her clothes, the doc wouldn't look so peaked. Spit. Silence. Yeah, Juanita's always talking about her, too. From Earl. She says Mrs. Kennicott thinks she knows it all. Juanita says she has to laugh till she almost busts every time she sees Mrs. Kennicott parading along the street with that take a look, I'm a swell skirt way she's got. But gosh, I don't pay no attention to Juanita. She's meaner'n a crab. Ma was telling somebody that she heard that Mrs. Kennicott claimed she made forty dollars a week when she was on some job in the cities, and Ma says she knows positively that she never made but eighteen a week. Ma says that when she's lived here a while she won't go round making a fool of herself, pulling that big-head stuff on folks that know a whole lot more than she does. They're all laughing up their sleeves at her. Say, do you ever notice how Mrs. Kennicott fusses around the house? Other evening when I was coming over here she forgot to pull down the curtain, and I watched her for ten minutes. Geez, you'd a died laughing. She was there all alone, and she must have spent five minutes getting a picture straight. It was funny as hell the way she'd stick out her finger to straighten the picture. Deedle dee, see my ton and ittle finger. Oh my, ain't I cute! What a fine long tail my cat's got! But say, Earl, she's some good looker just the same. And oh, Ignatz, the glad rag she must have bought for her wedding. Did you ever notice these low cut dresses and these thin shimmy shirts she wears? I had a good squint at em when they were out on the line with the wash. And some ankle she's got, eh? Then Carol fled. In her innocence, she had not known that the whole town could discuss even her garments, her body. She felt that she was being dragged naked down Main Street. The moment it was dusk, she pulled down the window shades, all the shades flush with the sill, but beyond them she felt moist, fleering eyes. 3. She remembered, and tried to forget, and remembered more sharply the vulgar detail of her husband's having observed the ancient customs of the land by chewing tobacco. She would have preferred a prettier vice, gambling or a mistress. For these she might have found a luxury of forgiveness. She could not remember any fascinatingly wicked hero of fiction who chewed tobacco. She asserted that it proved him to be a man of the bold free West. She tried to align him with the hairy-chested heroes of the motion pictures. She curled on the couch a pallid softness in the twilight, and fought herself, and lost the battle. Spitting did not identify him with rangers riding the buttes, it merely bound him to Gopher Prairie, to Nat Hicks the tailor and Bert Tybee the bartender. But he gave it up for me. Oh, what does it matter? We're all filthy in some things. I think of myself as so superior, but I do eat and digest, I do wash my dirty paws and scratch. I'm not a cool slim goddess on a column, there aren't any. He gave it up for me, he stands by me, believing that everyone loves me. He's the rock of ages, in a storm of meanness that's driving me mad, it will drive me mad." All evening she sang Scotch ballads to Kennicott and when she noticed that he was chewing an unlighted cigar, she smiled maternally at his secret. She could not escape asking, in the exact words and mental intonations which a thousand million women, dairy wenches and mischief-making queens, had used before her, and which a million million women will know hereafter. Was it all a horrible mistake, my marrying him? She quieted the doubt, without answering it. Four. Kennicott had taken her north to Lac Wamur, in the big woods. It was the entrance to a Chippewa Indian reservation, a sandy settlement among Norway pines on the shore of a huge, snow-glaring lake. She had her first sight of his mother, except the glimpse at the wedding. Mrs. Kennicott had a hushed and delicate breeding which dignified her woodeny, overscrubbed cottage, with its worn, hard cushions and heavy rockers. She had never lost the child's miraculous power of wonder. She asked questions about books and cities. She murmured, 
Will is a dear, hard-working boy, but he's inclined to be too serious, and you've taught him how to play. Last night I heard you both laughing about the old Indian basket-seller, and I just lay in bed and enjoyed your happiness." Carol forgot her misery-hunting in this solidarity of family life. She could depend upon them. She was not battling alone. Watching Mrs. Kennicott flit about the kitchen, she was better able to translate Kennicott himself. He was matter-of-fact, yes, and incurably mature. He didn't really play. He let Carol play with him. But he had his mother's genius for trusting, her disdain for prying, her sure integrity. From the two days at Lac Lemur, Carol drew confidence in herself, and she returned to Gopher Prairie in a throbbing calm, like those golden drugged seconds when, because he is for an instant free from pain, a sick man revels in living. A bright, hard winter day, the wind shrill, black and silver clouds booming across the sky, everything in panic emotion during the brief light. They struggled against the surf of wind, through deep snow. Kennicott was cheerful. He hailed Lauren Wheeler. "'Behave yourself while I've been away?' the editor bellowed. "'But gosh, you stayed so long that all your patients have got well!' and importantly took notes for the Dauntless about their journey. Jackson Elder cried, "'Hey, folks, how's tricks up north?' Mrs. Gannam waved to them from her porch. "'They're glad to see us. We mean something here. These people are satisfied. Why can't I be? But can I sit back all my life and be satisfied with, hey, folks? They want shouts on Main Street, and I want violins in a paneled room. Why? 5. Vida Sherwin ran in after school a dozen times. She was tactful, torrentially anecdotal. She had scuttled about town and plucked compliments. Mrs. Dr. Westlake had pronounced Carol a very sweet, bright, cultured young woman, and Brad Bemis, the tinsmith at Clark's hardware store, had declared that she was easy to work for and awful easy to look at. But Carol could not yet take her in. She resented this outsider's knowledge of her shame. Vida was not too long tolerant. She hinted, "'You're a great brooder, child. Buck up now. The town's quit criticizing you almost entirely. Come with me to the Thanatopsis Club. They have some of the best papers and current events discussions. So interesting." In Vida's demands, Carol felt a compulsion, but she was too listless to obey. It was B. Sorensen who was really her confidant. However charitable toward the lower classes she may have thought herself, Carol had been reared to assume that servants belonged to a distinct and inferior species. But she discovered that B. was extraordinarily like girls she had loved in college, and as a companion altogether superior to the young matrons of the Jolly Seventeen. Daily they became more frankly two girls playing at housework. B. artlessly considered Carol the most beautiful and accomplished lady in the country. She was always shrieking, "'My, that's a swell hat!' or, I think all these ladies used die when they see how elegant do your hair. But it was not the humbleness of a servant, nor the hypocrisy of a slave, it was the admiration of freshmen for junior. They made out the day's menus together. Though they began with propriety, Carol sitting by the kitchen table and B at the sink or blacking the stove, the conference was likely to end with both of them by the table while B. gurgled over the Iceman's attempt to kiss her, or Carol admitted, "'Everybody knows that the doctor's lots more clever than Dr. McGannum.' When Carol came in from marketing, B. plunged into the hall to take off her coat, rub her frosted hands, and ask, "'Was there lots of folks uptown today?' This was the welcome upon which Carol depended. 6. Through her weeks of cowering, there was no change in her surface life. No one save Vida was aware of her agonizing. On her most despairing days she chatted to women on the street, in stores. But without the protection of Kennicott's presence she did not go to the Jolly Seventeen. She delivered herself to the judgment of the town only when she went shopping and on the ritualistic occasions of formal afternoon calls, when Mrs. Lyman Cass or Mrs. George Edwin Mott 
with clean gloves and minute handkerchiefs and sealskin card cases and countenances of frozen approbation, sat on the edges of chairs and inquired, Do you find Gopher Prairie pleasing? When they spent evenings of social profit and loss at the Haydocks or the Dryers, she hid behind Kennicott playing the simple bride. Now she was unprotected. Kennicott had taken a patient to Rochester for an operation. He would be away for two or three days. She had not minded. She would loosen the matrimonial tension and be a fanciful girl for a time. But now that he was gone, the house was listeningly empty. B was out this afternoon, presumably drinking coffee and talking about fellows with her cousin Tina. It was the day for the monthly supper and evening bridge of the Jolly Seventeen, but Carol dared not go. She sat alone. End of chapter 9